thank you very much, uh, everyone, uh, for being here today. Thank you, Merwan, for the kind of invitation. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, transfer learning. <coughs> this is something that uh, we all experience in our everyday life. Uh, suppose you learn a new language, then you will find out that it's easier to learn another language after that. Uh, it's been shown also that um, if, you if you teach music to young kids uh, as early as like nine months, they will be able to learn uh, language faster after. Okay? So this is this idea that we all experience that when we learn something in one domain, then we can learn better and faster other things in other domains. But before talking about transfer learning, uh, <coughs> I would like to speak a little bit about Okin for those of you uh, who don't know what it is. Uh, and then I will uh, explain you how transfer learning uh, can be applied uh, to medicine and uh, how it can be uh, maybe a solution for very big problems. So uh, who, who we are at Okin and uh, what we do. Um, so Okin is a new startup company that was founded uh, last year. Uh, and uh, we have uh, offices in New York and uh, here in, in Paris. Uh, and I'm the chief scientist and I lead here in Paris the, the scientific team. Um, Thomas Clausel is my uh, partner in this uh, startup. He's uh, an oncologist, so he's a medical doctor. And he used to work in uh, the field of uh, predictive medicine. He developed uh, techniques to predict uh, response to chemotherapy uh, using epigenomic data. And uh, I used to be uh, from uh, academia since I was working in uh, ENS uh, for the last uh, two, three years. And I've been working a lot on applications of machine learning in the field of uh, medicine. Right now, we are a team of about 10 people. Uh, and uh, we have uh, exceptional uh, machine learning engineers and uh, top data scientists uh, that performed uh, among the, the best in the, all the international competitions, such as uh, Kaggle. Uh, and uh, what we do is that we develop algorithms and softwares uh, in collaborations with uh, biotech companies, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals, and academic labs. So I will show you the four major topics that we are covering in the company. Uh, so what we do is that we <coughs> develop these machine learning techniques to address uh, fundamental problems in the drug discovery and development process. And in this process, there are several steps that are very uh, time consuming and that cost a lot. If you want to develop a drug today, it will cost you around $1 uh, billion to perform uh, 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 the drug design, drug development, clinical trial, all the process from the ID to the market. And it fails a lot. It fails um, more than one out of two, uh, when more than 50% of the case. And uh, to, to achieve, uh, to transform this process, this workflow end to end using artificial intelligence, we focus our uh, development on drug design. How can we use uh, machine learning algorithms to predict uh, molecular activity at the chemical level? We work on clinical trials. Now that you have a molecule, you want to uh, test it in a population. How can you use the data you have accumulated until the phase three, for instance, to select the right uh, subgroup of people that will respond to the drug and uh, this is also there is a clear need for predictive models. We work on real, re real world evidence so meaning that we work for instance with hospitals with data coming from uh, general practitioners uh, for instance we work with Institut Curie <coughs> to work on uh, clinical data in a free text form meaning that this is data that is written by the doctors and it's a huge, huge amount of data, millions of documents. Uh, and we also work on images. 
this is a little bit uh, transversal because it can be used for clinical trials, for real-world evidence. Uh, and this is maybe one of the field right now, medical images, where deep learning can have the, uh, the, the more impact in the next few months or few years. Uh, and there are a lot of people trying to, to do that. So now I'm going to talk about uh, transfer learning, give you some ideas uh, about <coughs> what is transfer learning, how can it be applied uh, in medicine, and then uh, after that, we'll take some time to discuss about more uh, general uh, ideas about collaborative artificial intelligence and uh, the, the data sharing problem. So just uh, before starting, uh, that in medicine, data uh, is often uh, uh, has very specific um, properties. The, the first one is that it's something that should uh, be kept private. Okay? Medical data is something that is not to be shared to everyone. One has to be very careful. Second point, uh, it's often uh <coughs> coming in small data, okay? It's, it's really uh, not common to go and see a doctor or a, a lab and, and he says, I have data for one million patients. It never happens, okay? Uh, often you have data sets of, like say, a few hundred images. So uh, these two uh, specific features are really important to bear in mind and uh, we'll I will show you why these two key features put in perspective this idea of transfer learning as really something that can be uh, very useful. So first, uh, what is transfer learning? Okay, so it, this is a domain of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, which uh, is focused on this ability that an algorithm uh, can improve its learning capacities, either it can learn faster or it can learn better, to achieve uh, better accuracy on a given data set through the previous exposure to a different data set. Okay? So uh, you have the, the task that you want to perform on your data, and then you have this other data that can be helpful to uh, solve your task. And you can use transfer learning so that your algorithm can learn other stuff on uh, these other data sets. They can be different, it can be different types of problem, it can be a different task, it can be uh, anything, but there are some things that can be extracted. Uh, <coughs> one point that is very important also is that uh, deep learning architectures um, are very well suited for the transfer learning approach. And uh, the reason is that these deep learning architectures, they operate by different layers in a hierarchical way, okay? And uh, often what we realize is that the first layers uh, can learn some, some, some things that are very general, okay, on, on the data set, very basic, uh, such as uh, discovering contours or basic structures, basic uh, texture of, uh, of a cell, of an, any medical images, and that can be transferred then to another problem. And I think this, this precise point is one of the key hidden reasons behind the success of deep learning. As I mentioned in the early introduction, it's also a cognitive phenomenon in humans, uh, that learning things in one domain can help you learn things faster and better in other domains. And personally, we will discuss about mathematics later. Personally, I think that uh, mathematics is really a good example of that. That people who are educated in, math in mathematics uh, can uh, learn faster many other things after that. But I'm speaking in the home of mathematics, so I'm safe here to say that but maybe not everyone will agree. Um, anyway, so uh, it's very interesting that we, we are entering this, this uh, era of artificial intelligence where we can 
uh, have this uh, connection between, between a cognitive phenomenon that seems very powerful and very abstract, this idea that if I learn mathematics, I can be good at law or philosophy. Okay. This very, very con uh, abstract concept is now really present today in uh, everyday life of uh, people doing machine learning. So this is uh, an idea, I think it's, uh, it's really um, exciting. So I just want to give you uh, two, uh, two examples of uh, how can it work in general if, uh, uh, for uh, deep learning and then we go into uh, two, three specific examples in medicine. So very generally, what uh, people uh, do every day in the deep learning community is something like that. It's called warm restart. Okay? So what they do is that they want to solve a problem. They want to be able to classify uh, uh, cancer versus non-cancer from uh, medical images, for instance. So they have a bunch of, say, 100 images of each class. Okay? If using 100 images of each class, you want to train a deep learning algorithm from scratch, using completely random initial condition of your neural network weights, it will most likely be a failure, okay? Because you have too many parameters to, to train and you have not uh, enough samples, okay? So what you can do is say, well, I can't do anything, please come back to me with more data. This is something you can tell to the doctor that gives you the data. But what, what you can do as well is something that may seem completely crazy. You say, you start from your random, random neural network, your initial condition, then you train it on a very large database called ImageNet that most of you uh, know, I assume. It's a, um, a database with a million images, 10,000 uh, classes that shows plane, cars, cat, dogs, whatever. And the, the, the task here is to classify all these pictures. So you train your, your neural network on this uh, database. It gives you what we called a pre-trained neural network at the end of, tra of training. This neural network is now able, if you give him a picture of a, a, a lion or a car, to tell you if this is a lion or a car. Okay? So it has learned things, it has learned how to see things, uh, but not uh, especially medical images. So why are we doing that? Does it have any chance to work? Then, uh, when, once you have this, uh, this pre-trained neural network, then you can use it as an initial condition to train uh, your deep learning algorithm on the data that you are interested in. Okay? And basically you do the same as if you were starting from an initial condition that is random, but you, you just change the initial condition. The training process is all governed by the same backpropagation algorithm that you like. Okay? But you just change the initial condition. And if you do that with just uh, uh, a few hundred images, you will see that the improvement in performance <laughs> is really uh, astonishing. And I will show you uh, some examples after. We can also do other things. There are many, many other possibilities. I want just to show you another one that is uh, uh, quite interesting. Is the idea of shared representation. Is the idea that you can train your network to classify plane and cars, okay, and lions. Uh, then it gives you this pre-trained network. Then you start from an initial condition that is random on your medical images, but what you do is that you uh, penalize your loss function, you had, a, uh, you had a regularization that tells you that your new network should look like uh, the one that was trained on ImageNet or that the features, the activation of the neurons should look like the ones that are on ImageNet. So it's a, a process of regularization that has the same kind of effect that the warm restart, but sometimes uh, it can work better. So le let's, let's go into some uh, concrete examples now. Okay, so there is always in, in teaching 
this uh, debate, should I start with examples or with the theory? So I decided to start with the general theory, and then I show the examples. We'll see if it works. <laughs> so uh, here is the cover of Nature, uh, February this year. Okay, so it's like two months old, so already very old. <laughs> uh, and uh, the cover of Nature, it shows uh, a paper that has really shaken the world of dermatologists. Okay, so we have a lot of dermatologists that come and see Hawking right now <laughs> to see how we can help them. Uh, and basically, these people in this article, they, uh, they applied uh, deep learning techniques to classify skin cancer, okay, using pictures. And uh, what, they, what they show in their article is that they obtain the same, uh, the same level of performance in terms of classification accuracy than a group of experts, dermatologists. Okay? So in 2017, this is where we are right now. Th these kind of systems, if they are trained of on, uh, on a data database that is large enough, they are able to perform as good as doctors, and there are other papers that uh, we can discuss, I can give you the reference, that shows that in other problems they can even perform better. And here, uh, what this, is, this picture is just uh, an excerpt from their article in Nature, uh, and uh, what they show in right in the middle here is called Deep Convolutional Neural Network Inception V3. What is in Inception V3? Inception V3 is the name that Google gave to the neural network they trained on the ImageNet. Okay? The same pre-trained neural network I was talking about. So you have to know that these this pre-trained neural networks on ImageNet, uh, there exists a zoo of models. Okay? There exist many models. Google has uh, Inception V3, maybe, I don't know, Maybe there is a new one that has been uh, that has come out. You have Microsoft that has another network. You have Facebook. You have uh, also Academic Labs, etc. Each one has its pre-trained neural network on Imagine. Then what these guys did in Nature, uh, they they took that as a starting point and then they do the warm restart. Okay, so they keep the architecture and they just uh, do the gradient descent on the weights. And the, the real tour de force in this article is the, the size of the database. I told you that it, could, it can work with a few hundred images. That's true. But if you want to achieve on this very hard problem the same kind of performance as uh, expert dermatologists, then uh, you need around 100,000 images. Okay? And this is not easy to gather. So this is really very impressive. So this is a, a very concrete example, and right now all the dermatologist community is really trying to understand how things are going to organize around this kind of uh, technologies. I want just to give you two more examples of things that we do in the company. Uh, so this is a work that we've been uh, doing with a, a biotech company that is developing new drugs uh, on a disease called pulmonary fibrosis. It, it's a, a very bad disease that can kill people in a few months, and there is no real treatment at the moment. Uh, and their goal was to uh, develop a system that can grade fibrosis, so that you have low grade, it means that the fibrosis is not uh, spread and it's not uh, very important, and high grade means that it's very bad, okay, it's very severe. And when they uh, uh, develop new molecules, they want to test. If I give this molecule, will the grade be lower after a few weeks? Okay? So they do clinical trials, preclinical trials, and they want to assess the, the, the grading. And usually they do that with uh, a team of expert pathologists that look at the image. Uh, so these images are taken from, bi from biopsies uh, uh, of the lung and they are, they are scanned at very high resolution. So here, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a challenge here on the side, is that images are gigapixel images, so meaning that you have 100,000 per 100,000 pixels. So it's very big images. 
and we were given only around 100 image, images with five different classes. Okay, so you have like 20 examples per classes and images, images are more than one gigapixels. Uh, and basically, we are not still at the level of uh, the agreement of, in, of pathologists. But what we realize is that if we uh, do the, the um, uh, neural network training from scratch, okay, then it performs around 65% uh, accuracy in the five class program. But if we use a neural network that was pre-trained uh, on this car, plane, lion, and etc. Uh, task, then it performs way better. Okay, so this is a very precise, concrete example of how <coughs> transfer learning can give uh, a very important improvement of the of the results uh, due to this problem of having only uh, a, f a few data points. Okay. And this is a very common problem in, uh, in medical problems. The second example, uh, okay, the last example I wanted to uh, discuss here um, is, is a project that we've been doing in the last few, few months. Uh, it's, it's a challenge organized by the, the Kaggle platform. So Kaggle is a, uh, is a platform for data science competitions that gathers all the best uh, machine learning and data science uh, engineers and teams over the world. So it has more than uh, 100,000 uh, users and it's been the platform has been acquired by Google uh, recently. And uh, on this platform there was a challenge with a price of one million dollars. Uh, and this challenge uh, is the one that we, we try to play. Uh, and it's, it's called early detection of lung cancer from CT scans. So what is the game? You are given 1,500 CT scans. Uh, and for each patient that you have, you have uh, uh, just a label that tells you if this patient has or will develop a cancer within 12 months uh, time frame, starting from the, from, from the um, exam. So what is a CT scan? A CT scan is uh, a 3D representation of what's inside your body. Uh, you have like 200 slices and each slice is around 500 per 500 pixel and it looks like that and you can uh, reconstruct in three dimensions if you want uh, the, the, um, what's inside the lung. Um, this is very challenging because we have only, only around 1,000 uh, da data points and uh, the, the signal is really, really small compared to the volume of data we have. Because the signal is hidden in the, the idea that, okay, this guy has a, a nodule, so it's a mass in the, in the lung that is uh, very important to diagnose this type of lung cancer. And these nodules, it's just... Uh, a few centimeters, so it's just a few dozens of pixels patch 3D, okay? So you have like a uh, uh, very, very small, tiny uh, needle in the haystack and you have a lot of information around about the lung that is completely useless and that is completely noise for your machine learning algorithm. So it's a very, we call it a, a very strong, weak labeling problem. And uh, in this problem, everything that we tried, just using the data given in the competition, completely failed. And I mean, the, the, the guys in the team are very strong and they tried a lot of things. And I think it's almost impossible to solve this challenge with only this data. So we had to find another way. We had to find a way to <coughs> bring knowledge from outside. Okay, because it was really not possible to design something that, that would work. Uh, so the final ranking is tense. So we didn't win the one million dollar, but we still earn, uh, we still win a, a small price. But we, uh, most importantly, we uh, learn about the strategy to solve these kind of problems. So I put aside the fact that it's a three D problem. Okay. 
and 3D convolutional neural networks are not as easy to manipulate than two-dimensionals, but I would say it's a side problem. The, the real idea was to bring external knowledge through another data set. So we used this idea of transfer learning very, very strongly in this case, and it was the only way for us to get something that worked. So there is this other data set called Luna uh, that has been uh, designed for another task with other patients in an other challenge the, way the, the year uh, before. Okay? And the other task was uh, to work on uh, uh, segmentation of nodules on CT scans. It was not about early detection. So it was something with different labels, different patients. It was a different data set. So what we did is that we trained a neural network to uh, distinguish the nodules. So we uh, uh, split, we, we extract uh, patches in three dimensions. Okay, and each patch, we have this annotation that tells you here you have a, uh, you have a nodule and we can give you this di his diameter or we can tell you here there is no nodule and this is the kind of label that we have from the Luna da data set. So this is, uh, uh, this is an information that is localized in space. Okay, compared to the uh, annotation on the Kegel data, which is completely not localized. We ju they just tell us if this patient has a cancer or not, but they don't tell you where is the nodule, etc. So there is pretty much nothing you can really learn. Uh, so you train first this three-dimensional convolutional neural network on this Luna data set. So it has uh, five uh, convolutional uh, layer with uh, pooling, uh, so that at the end, uh, with 64 channels, so that at the end you, you flatten everything and you have just uh, 512 uh, vector, okay? Uh, and from this vector of dimension 512, it means that you can uh, have a representation of a given patch of 64 uh, pixels uh, of, uh, of size, okay? And now what you do is that you have trained these networks, you have the weights, it's here. You take your data from the Kaggle dataset, you, you, you extract patches, so you do, with, you do it with overlap, but you just scan everything on the patient, all the patches. Then you put it in the CNN, you extract your uh, vector of representation, and then you do some uh, max pooling so that at the end you uh, erase all the spatial information, so everything becomes invariant in space. And from that, you can do uh, classification with these new features. We could also have done some uh, global fine tuning of the whole process, but uh, still it was very complex to, to make it work. And at the end, we do uh, gradient tree boosting to do the classification. Okay? And uh, this, uh, uh, this strategy, we realized that uh, among the top 10, almost everyone has done something similar. Okay? So it was really, uh, may maybe not the only way, but I really challenge uh, everyone here in, in the room to achieve a very uh, a significant result without having this transfer learning approach. So here we see there are some very important problems, very difficult, with a $1 million price, and the only way to find uh, a solution that uh, starts to work is based on transfer learning. So this is not an anecdotal technique. This is really at the heart of many, many applications of deep learning. So now that uh, I gave you this uh, compelling uh, story about the use of transfer learning uh, uh, in, in the field of medicine, I would like to uh, uh, maybe take the time I ha have here to uh, dream a little and uh, to try to uh, move uh, one layer of abstraction uh, above and think, think about what uh, this kind of technologies could make uh, possible in the future. Right now, if you think about uh, classical statistics, for instance, each time you have a problem of uh, hypothesis testing, of estimation of parameters or whatever, you start from a white page. Okay? Each time you have a new data set, it's a new problem, and you start again. 
with transfer learning, the idea is that uh, you can uh, build up systems that learn from a given data set, then they are able to perform a task, and then you can reuse them to do another task and to learn other things. And you can climb like that, and you can build systems that can uh, become better and better uh, when they are exposed to different tasks. It's like humans, it's like uh, this uh, sentence like uh, standing on the shoulder of, of giants. The, this idea that uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, are entering an era where uh, they are not isolated anymore. Okay? These algorithms can like, talk to each other through transfer learning. Okay? So why uh, is, is it so important? So clearly, uh, what we, we, we have shown here is that transfer learning okay, is one of, the key for me, uh, one of the key reasons behind the success of deep learning, and it brings the power of machine learning to small data sets that would not be amenable to classical machine learning solutions. But as I said, it opens the way to collaborative artificial intelligence. And uh, I, I would like to show you how here at Okin we imagine the, the, the future. So our idea is to build uh, a collaborative artificial in intelligence platform, okay, where each contributor would be uh, a lab, a hospital, a doctor, whoever has some data okay, that is labeled. Suppose you are, you are a doctor, you have 500 images of uh, breast cancer that respond to chemotherapy, 500 images of breast cancer that do not respond well to chemotherapy. You have this data. This data uh, is very important. It, can, it needs to stay private most of the time. Uh, and maybe it's not enough data to build a powerful algorithm. But you know that other people around the world, they have this kind of data. So the idea is that as a contributor, you can uh, um, create new algorithms, or you can participate in the creation of new algorithms, uh, and, and these algorithms can improve each other through transfer learning, going from one center to the other. Uh, and then the community of users, the people, the, the doctors that want to use this algorithm to make predictions and say, well, I need to predict if this uh, patient will respond well to chemotherapy or not, can use the algorithms that are built on the platform, okay? And so the idea is that uh, you, you, don't, you don't need really anymore to have like just a, a team of someone who has the data and someone who designed the algorithm and they work together. <coughs> okay, this is something that is uh, very important, but we are thinking uh, for the future and we think that uh, this, can be, this can become a, a platform system and uh, we can um, move toward something that is more collaborative and with the idea that people can keep da their data. So we have uh, a prototype of, of that, that concept that is working, that we are currently installing in several hospitals in Paris, in Lyon, in New York, uh, where each user uh, who has medical image can create algorithm just uh, without uh, any coding skills. Uh, it can apply the algorithm to new uh, new image that come in the clinic and share the algorithms that have been trained to other people uh, on the platform. Uh, but uh, I think really here the, um, the, fi the final point I want to make in this conference is maybe the, the, more imp the most important one. We are uh, doing all these nice predictive models, but clearly what is really lacking today and for the future in the medical community and in, in, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence for, for medicine is the, uh, is the motion, is the dynamic toward an actual data sharing uh, um, solution. Right now, the, the data, the medical data is really spread across uh, many different centers, many different hospitals, many different uh, pharmaceutical companies, etc. All this data is really not, at the moment, uh, shared. 
in a common place. Okay? And this is a huge problem because if we want to be able to uh, train powerful artificial intelligence algorithms that can help doctors, that can help patients, that can help predicting the effect of a treatment to give the right drug to the right patient, if we want to do that, uh, the first, uh, the ma most major obstacle is this data sharing problem. Okay? And we, heard, we hear every year at very nice conferences, very nice people saying, well, we are committed to data sharing, we are going to create this platform where everyone can put his data together, etc., etc. It's, uh, if you say that, people think you are someone good, so it's good to say that. But in reality, uh, it's not happening. It's not happening right now, and I think for many, many reasons, uh, privacy, uh, intellectual property, different uh, things like that, it's not going to happen soon at a large scale. Okay? So if we want to do something uh, powerful that exploits all this data that is already here, we need to find another solution. And I think that uh, uh, these ideas around transfer learning can be very, very helpful. Uh, and in fact, it's, it's, uh, it's very simple, the idea behind, because transfer learning is just you train your network on uh, a, a given data set, you use it as an initial condition for the, the next training, so it's just about doing a gradient descent and following the path, you know, and just you stop at one point and you start again. So the standard approach would be to gather all the data, as I said, in one place. Okay, so you go, you knock on hospital A door, you say, can you give me your data, I will put it in a secure place, you go to hospital B, to hospital C, or you can do that, you can imagine doing that with uh, general practitioners, so it's not a few hundreds hospitals, it's a few hundreds of thousands of doctors, okay, or you can imagine uh, that this problem can uh, arise with Internet of Things, and connected objects that, m that uh, measure our health, okay? And we don't want to share our data with some uh, cloud provider or whatever, but we would like to benefit from the artificial intelligence that this system could offer, okay? So the scale of this problem is not only a few hundred hospitals, it can be millions of users. Okay, so what, qu what can we do to overcome this and say either this is not feasible or we don't want to do that. We think it's too risky to put all this data in the same hands. So the idea is really simple, is a uh, kind of a natural extension of the idea of transfer learning, uh, is the idea that you train your neural network uh, on the hospital A, A so you have your uh, 100 or 1,000 image uh, with uh, a given task here. And Hospital B has the same kind of images with the same kind of labels. So now that we, you have trained your network, you can make it travel to Hospital B. So the, the, the data stays uh, put in Hospital A, okay? But only the net neural network waits, travels, okay? So it's uh, brain traveling. Okay? You make the algorithm travel, and then you put the algorithm in hospital B, and you continue the training. Okay? So this is, I would say, uh, so you can, you can do that for all your users in your network, and you do one round, and you can do another round, etc., until your validation accuracy is, uh, is good enough. Uh, what, what you can do as well uh, is doing something that will exploit the, uh, all the computing power that can be put in each hospital by doing a parallel algorithm, okay? So you can do uh, like a parallel stochastic gradient descent so that, uh, suppose you are the coordinator of the process, you first, you spend, you send the same initial uh, network to all the hospitals at, at the same time, at the same time, okay? Each one does a training on his data set. And then what they give you back is the, the gradient, the change of the weights. Then what you do is an average of this change, 
Okay? So in the gradient distance, you average the contribution of each uh, of, the of the contributor who has data. And then you send back these new weights uh, to everyone, to synchronize everyone. And you do another batch like that, another epoch. Okay? So these, these kind of algorithms, it's called uh, parallel stochastic gradient descent. And there has been uh, recent research the last two years about how to improve that, how to make it work better, faster, uh, uh, especially in the context where you, you the, the network that we are making travel, they can be 100 megabytes, uh, maybe one gigabyte soon. Okay, so this, this, these are uh, objects that you should make travel not too often. Okay, so if you want to make it travel not too often, then you should try to optimize everything so that uh, it works well. It can be uh, also, uh, you can use that in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. If you don't want any third party involved, okay, you can make the neural network travel between users. Uh, and I think that uh, this idea is very powerful for, for, really for the future of artificial intelligence in medicine on a, on, on a wide scale, not only hospitals, but as I said, also for uh, data coming from doctors or for uh, consumers. Uh, and it's going well beyond medicine as well, because it's uh, a paradigm to be able to train artificial intelligence system uh, with keep, uh, without uh, jeopardizing the privacy of data. And I think as, as citizens, here in the room, we are all very concerned about that right now at the moment, okay? And, and uh, hopefully there are technological solutions that can be developed, that can have a huge potential for medicine, but also for, uh, uh, for the privacy of every citizen. So uh, I guess it's time for me to conclude. Uh, uh, I, I think my message was uh, clear today. So with transfer learning technologies, the, all these uh, artificial intelligence algorithms can cross-fertilize, okay? Uh, this uh, idea of algorithm sharing has a potential to circumvent the data sharing problem, okay? Uh, which is, the, to me, the major problem right now to, uh, for the emergence of uh, a lot of new artificial intelligence applications in medicine. And uh, we hope that developing these technologies can have a, a, a big impact because we work every day with doctors and uh, what we think uh, first is how can we make it happen uh, today. Okay, thank you very much. Is there questions? Uh, yeah, so my question is, uh, when you use data to pre-train and then train for something else, do you know how much the original knowledge is preserved after you do the, the, the second? Yeah, so you can destroy some, some knowledge you've learned, okay, but you can keep in the memory as well. So you can keep both. But uh, it, it, can, it can destroy knowledge. It doesn't work all the time, <coughs> of course. And, and it, it still remains unknown from a, I would say from a mathematical standpoint, how different the two data sets should be so that it works well. Because if the two data sets are too close, then it's just a matter of, a, of adding some new points and it's not very useful, okay? So you need some kind of difference, but not too much, okay? And it's like, uh, I would say uh, uh, it's like if you learn languages that are quite different, if you learn Turkish and Finnish, maybe it will be easier for you to learn Russian and Egyptian or whatever, okay? And, but if you learn only Spanish, Italian and French, then you are not in a uh, in good position, I think, to learn new, new languages. Yeah. In, in the city thing, uh, why didn't you fine-tune? Because, I mean, the transfer learning thing really makes sense if you fine-tune, since it's different data. Yeah, so we... just can take random features and you have people. No, 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 no. We use the features that were extracted right. from a network that was trained on the, the other. 
we didn't fine tune, but already f uh, uh, feature extraction uh, plus the gradient boosting worked well. And you may see the gradient boosting as just uh, doing a fine tuning of the last layer, if you want. Okay, if it's yeah. a linear stuff. The last layer is not fine tuning. If I the last layer, it's doing learning your classifier. It's learning the classifier. Then and you cannot. I'm sorry, I'm being a pain, but you cannot really call it transferring if you don't do any fine tuning. You are just taking pre existing features and use them, and they work pretty well, which is fine. If, if you want, uh, I'd, uh, I mean, we call, we call it uh, as you want. Okay. But you know, you know what I mean. Uh, I, I mean, uh, to me, it's still transfer learning. My, my question is about uh, uh, privacy. So yeah. um, you, you have this distributed scheme whereby, as you say, you don't need to, don't need to actually share the data that you use for the training. So mm -hmm. this is preserving privacy. So my question is, uh, if you assume that you only have access to the trained network yeah. after and before some training, yeah. what can you infer on the data that, is be, that has been used for? Okay, that, that's really an excellent question. Uh, and uh, this is a question we are currently working on in the team. Uh, I, my intuition is that if you only have the weights of the network, not the activations right, that uh, uh, occur when you present the input, but just the weights, uh, I would say it's very, very difficult to recover any data points. Maybe you don't want to recover the full data, but you might be able to infer like how many patients were affected with uh, this and that disease in a given data set that might be already uh, uh, too, too, too much information to Yeah, of course. So th that, that's an uh, excellent question. And we will be really happy to collaborate with ev anyone here uh, to work on, on the theoretical proof of that question about what can we infer knowing the weights about the data that was used for, strain for training. Maybe there exists some uh, very nice theorem already that I don't know. <laughs> okay, I don't know everything. Uh, but I think this question has not, very, uh, has not been very uh, uh, studied before. But it's a very good question. For the CT example, uh, if I understand well what you are using at the end, is just the diameter of the module? Uh, so the diameter of the nodule is used as, a, as the target yes. for the training here. Yes. So we, have, uh, we, we split it into several categories, like small, medium, large. Okay. And we have another category which is not, not a nodule. Because in the database of Luna, you have some... Uh, no, no, my yeah. question is uh, the outcome of your deep neural net on the uh, competition was... Uh, Yes, no. vector, it was a vector where you had a number of uh, I don't know, uh, diameters of... Uh, yeah. Okay, and that's what you used to predict? No, we used the, the layer yes, right okay. before. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what uh, uh, means you said that you were 10th, right? Yeah. On the competition? Yeah. But uh, the best... Yes. Uh, the best comp uh, what was his performance? Means, uh, are we detecting 80%? Uh, okay, so the, it was a log loss metric. Uh, the data set was relatively balanced, I guess, but anyway, it was like 0.4 of log loss. Which means, which means in our cross-validation, it was like 0.83 AUC. Okay, so you're at 83%? 83% AUC, okay. AUC metric. And this is useful? I mean, uh, because... Yeah, this is, so this is... is if, if, uh, when you fail, I mean, okay, so you... So th this, 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 uh, this is meant to be used to do a general screening of the population okay. and they want to reduce the number of false positives and false negatives. Okay. Uh, and this is a task that is n really not easy for the doctors. I mean, so I have worked a little bit on, uh, on lines and usually uh, the problem is that uh, for some of them you don't have any nodules yeah. with a year. So, yeah. so we, we had examples in the database where uh, these people were classified as having cancer or Yes. will develop cancer in the next 12 months. Yeah, there is a subtility okay. without nodules, yeah. but you have other markers like emphysemas and... and well, didn't use that, did we you? didn't use that. You were based on nodules, whatever was... Uh, so we were trying to predict whether... We were only on nodules and we, we ran out of time, but it was on our to-do list to integrate other uh, things like that.
And uh, why uh, you couldn't train a whole network at the very beginning or just to the... No, yeah, yeah, we tried uh, to do a lot of things on just the data set. Yeah. And you can try, you will see. Well, it's because you have too few samples, that's why. Yeah, you have too few samples and, and uh, the information is lost in the middle of a lot of other uh, things that are completely not related to the disease. So... You have more samples for the Kaggle data set than on the... Yeah, the but the annotation... The, the annotation in the Kaggle dataset is global. It just tells you if the, the patient has okay, the cancer or not. No, no. Ah, okay, okay. And on the other dataset, you have a local uh, okay, information. Okay, okay, I see. Okay, you can take the last question. Okay. Yeah. Two questions. Uh, fast <laughs> question. The first one is related with the security one. So, in this process, do, do, do you share your algorithm? So, in which process? In, in the, for example, if you have uh, isolated data centers. Yeah. And if you want them to provide you the output, do, do you share your ag ag algorithm? So we share the algorithm between the different users that are uh, taking part in solving the problem. But then the question is uh, whether we share the resulting algorithms to the global community in the world. It's something that uh, can be done sometimes and other times uh, is not done depending on uh, the different parties at stakes and different uh, problems. Okay. So, of course, uh, it's, it would be better to share the resulting al algorithm to everyone, mm -hmm. but then if there are a lot of money that is invested on that and that people want to keep for them, then you enter, uh, the, uh, you, you have this, this problem that is uh, all the time like that. I think if you share the algorithm, then as if, if I'm a data center, as if I have the control, of the, how to say, several of the dynamic of the algorithm because I can uh, provide some specific data such that I want some specific outcome. Yeah. <coughs> see, yeah. So this is some kind of security problem that if I'm a ma malicious player, I can provide some specific data such that I, I, I can have some control of the algorithm outcome. Okay, we, so you mean a malicious player that will disguise as a hospital and take control of the... That's... No, okay. So, okay, th this could happen maybe in... Okay, that's very... <laughs> that's a very clever question, <laughs> uh, but... Uh, no collaborative game. Yeah, we, we, are, we are much on the ground right now and we talk with people on the phone and we say, okay, did you receive the network? And <laughs> a module system and this could happen. Yeah, yeah okay, th that, that's uh, in the same direction of the other question like that, is how this kind of system system is really secure Dynamic and change. yeah yeah okay that that's very very interesting and second question is normally we know that uh, individual opti optimization or learning may not a sequence of individual uh, learning may not lead to social optimal so how can you make sure that during this dynamic process you can um, how to say increasingly improve uh, at the mathematical level, you need some, at least some, uh, some proof or some... Uh yeah, so I mean, if, if you take, uh, say, the MNIST dataset with a uh, handwritten recognition uh, uh, problem, okay, if you split the dataset into 10 different parts and you put one part in each hospital, okay, first that would call you crazy, why do something? <laughs> but then uh, uh, you, can, you can train and you, s you put that back the, the weights and you send it back and you train, etc. And you will see it will converge uh, almost uh, as if you had all the data in the same place. So uh, it's, it's right now it's more, I would say, it's uh, uh, a bunch of experimental results, but also the process really m mathematically is really like doing the gradient descent. And there are also some... You have some com uh, potential yeah. e effect that when you're optimizing um, some distributed uh, problem, then you, you are converging to the, to the potential of the problem. Like yeah, so there are connections. And, and there is a lot of theory existing already on, on uh, parallel stochastic gradient descent. But, uh, um, okay, I, I think that if we go into the specifics, Maybe there are some, some different things that should be proven to be uh, sure mathematically, but still uh, in our first experiments, 
things are quite uh, working in the right direction. Yeah, I think we should stop here and thank the